and thank you once again to the organizers for this kind invitation. It's truly a privilege to be speaking at this meeting. Now, we all know the benefits of lateral lumbar interbody fusion. In short, it's got good biomechanical stability, good for deformity correction, not just in the sagittal, but also in the coronal plane, and unique features such as indirect decompression, great for revision cases, and also MRS procedures, not just the short, but also in the long constructs. And when we talk about lateral lumbar interbody fusion, we can broadly classify them into the pre psoas or the trans psoas approach. Personally, I swap from the trans psoas approach to the pre psoas approach because I was having too much issues with thigh pain. I didn't want to have any concerns with the injuring the uh, lumbar plexus, neural structures. And now with the olive approach, the eyelid crest seldom is an issue. However, for the early adopters of this technique, I think it can be, con can be concerning because you're going closer anteriorly. Now you're closer to the vessels, you're closer to the peritoneum ureter, and you're worrying about in injuring these structures. And also the oblique trajectory, how do you actually put a true lateral cage? So knowing what kind of concerns there are for the olive approach, let's look into the literature to find out what are the common complications associated with this, focusing on the olive 2-5 technique. First up is this paper from Japan. They had 3,000 cases. The common ones were sensory nerve injury, 3.5% and source weakness, about 3%. Less common, but more concerning for us, segmental artery injury and peritoneal laceration by less than 1%. Rick Hines, who was the inventor of this technique, reported vascular injuries to be about 2.9%. But we look closer on this, actually, for the OLIF 2.5 technique, he didn't, have, he didn't have any cases, 0% of vascular injury and 10% for the 5.1 technique, which is understandable. And finally, another paper out of Japan shows that the most common uh, complications actually amplify injury and cage subsidence, ranging up to 18.7%. So for me, I feel there are six key areas that we can do and we need to look out for to avoid complications. So let's run through these step by step. First of all, is this a good case to start? And I'll suggest to look at three anatomical constraints. The first one we all know, is the vascular corridor present and is wide enough, right? Because if you have the aorta very close to the psoas, probably not a good case to start. But I'll take it a step further to look at the psoas anatomy as well. I can see picture on the left, you can see the psoas is not very high riding, but picture on the right, you can see the psoas is very high riding. And that makes it very difficult for you to retract the psoas all the way back posteriorly so that you can um, do your procedure. So look at the psoas and we found that for A1 and 2 is suitable and A3 and 4, which means like a Mickey Mouse psoas, it will be harder for the early adopters to perform this technique. The last thing you need to do is so in your pre-evaluation is to look at the eyelid crest. Is the eyelid crest going to be in your way? Now, if you're doing a left-sided approach, you can see that this disc is facing towards the eyelid crest, and that might make it a little bit difficult. Still possible. However, be careful. If your tube cannot be centered along the disc space, you might risk um, your instruments going into the end plate and cause end plate injury. Now, the next area of interest is how do I ensure that my cage is not inserted obliquely? And that's where rotation comes in, right? Positioning is very important. We think that we're inserting the cage on the long axis of the disc space. However, if the patient is rotated, what happens is that we may, we may be inserting the cage in the same direction. Instead, it might hit the contralateral nerve root. Or even worse, what if the patient is rotated the other way around and we end up hitting the venous uh, structures on the other side, especially using our cobs or shavers. So this is why it's important when you start off, make sure the patient is in a true lateral position. So how do we do that? We start with a good AP where we can identify the pedicles nicely and the spinous process in the center. Once we know that the patient is in a true AP, then we shift okay, the floor 90 degrees and then now what we're having, we, have, we, are, we can do our marking nicely and we're going to get a true lateral and now we're not going to be rotated. This is particularly important, especially in the case of scoliosis, where you need to verify each level every time you're going to put in a cage. Next, how do I avoid peritoneal and ureteric injury? 
Now, I like using the direct look approach. So during the exposure, after cutting through the muscle layers, I like to put my finger all the way to the back. And then I poke through the retroperitoneal space and pull all the retroperitoneal fat along with the abdominal contents forward. Now, be careful of seeing this, uh, be careful of skinny patients because they got less retroperitoneal fat to protect you. And once that is done, I see the source muscle in all its glory. I see the anterior border, and I'm quite safe. They are not going to injure any of the abdominal contents. And where is the ureter? Well, the ureter is usually tucked in the uh, retroperitoneal fat, like you can see over here with the peristaltis. So it shouldn't be really coming to the surgical field. Next, I want to highlight the importance of cage positioning. I think it's always safe to put the cage in the middle. However, if you require more of an indirect decompression, then you can put the cage further back. But be mindful, not too far back, otherwise you cause a nerve injury. Now, if you want more lordosis, put the cage more anteriorly. Of course, be careful not too far front because you might cause an ALL rupture. For example, in this case, where the patient had a flat back and I wanted it to be more lordotic, my danger here is the cage sped out in the front, also because I also um, you did a standalone construct. So lesson learned, always back it up with posterior screws. Next, how do I prevent vessel injuries in Olive 2.5? I'll say two main vessels that you need to worry about, the segmental uh, vessels, which is located in the middle of the vertebral body. If you can, avoid a pin. But if you have to put a pin, Put it at the green dot that you can see over there, which is the lower edge of the vertebral body rather than the middle part of the vertebral body. Now, the other more devastating uh, vessel injury would be the L45 iliolumbar vein injury. And you can see that vein is located quite uniquely at the L45 region, particularly at the L5. So be very careful. Tip number one, do not dissect too caudal below the L45 this level. And we had one case out of the many cases that we had where we avulsed this during our dissection. And you can see the picture over here. The green uh, arrow is where the original incision was. And the red arrow is what we had to do to extend the incision to salvage. So the stats were this. When we had a vascular injury, first of all, apply compression, call for help, turn the patient to pine, extend our incision. Then when we extend our incision, we can see the psoas, which guides us to the eyelid vessels. Then we'll put a stitch and later we'll complete the surgery. So picture on the left is how it looked like. You know, patient was a supine and we extended our incision. And the blue arrow shows the iliolumbar uh, eyelid vessels. And we saw the, the, the iliolumbar vein that was avulsed. Here we completed our surgery with a T lift, and you can see that the patient is now able to ambulate uh, well uh, postoperatively. Lastly, how do I prevent cape subsidence? I think this is important because once you get subsidence, you lose the effect of indirect decompression, and that means that you might need to bring back the patient again to do a direct decompression. A few tips, if you encounter a high eyelid crest, careful, make sure you use angle instruments, like this, an angle curette, a curved cop, or using the olive procedure to work out of the retractor. Next tip, and I cannot emphasize this enough, if you have a collapse and fuse this space, make sure you perform the release first. Rather than just putting in the spreader and twisting it, what's going to happen? It's going to gouge us a big uh, piece of bone, right? So like here, you can use the corp instruments to go contralateral. And here I am breaking the annulus and osteophytes on the other side. And then... I can use my spreaders to open up the space and put in the cage. To summarize, take a look at the pre-op images carefully. Look at the three anatomical structures, the corridor, the psoas, and the eyelid crest. Position the patient so that it's a true lateral to prevent cage malpositioning. I like the direct look approach to prevent peritoneal or ureteric injury. Vessels, take care of the iliolumbar vein and the segmental vessels. And finally, prevent subsidence by careful end plate preparation and perform the releases before using the shavers or deletes. And with that, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.